Okay, so returning to this page again, the, we've done the two, the two lines and an intersection of a line and a plane. The last one we need to think about is the intersection of two planes. And as before, I've put this in brackets because it's something that it's not explicitly in the specification, but I'm going to show you one of the Edexcel questions that it was featured in. So I just thought it's worth us having a look at. Um, we'll do a bit of practice on that and then we'll finish up. We'll then probably spend two lessons doing this kind of stuff down here and then a third lesson doing like exam practice because this, this is a huge topic. This will come up guaranteed in your exam. Uh, and I think the year 13 still find vectors one of their hardest topics. So if you feel like you're on top of it now, that's a really, really good sign. OK, so intersection of two planes. Um, we'll come back to here. Oh, I just wanted to quickly point out, you'll notice when we were able to do for the intersection of a line in a plane that this thing that we had here was in the scalar form. If it was in its parametric form, I've written over here that the parametric form is kind of useless because you can't substitute it in and make it work. There's too many variables. So if you do have a parametric form of a plane, reminder that a parametric form is like this. If you have this form, you first of all have to find out what n is equal to. You have to find a normal, and then you have to find out what the r dot n form is equal to to be able to do this technique of substituting the line into the plane, OK? So if you get stuck in a homework or an exam question in the next few weeks and it's in a parametric form, try and remember that the parametric form is not very useful, but the parametric form is quite easy to build because if you know two vectors on the plane or if you know some coordinates on the plane, it's very easy to build this but it's not very useful in practice when you want to actually work things out with it, OK? So always aim for these kinds of things. The, param the, the scalar form, the dot product form is far better. OK, so intersection of two planes. These images remind us of what we've talked about in, um, in matrices. Thank you very much. And we're not going to be talking about the intersections of three planes here. We're just going to be talking about the intersections of two planes. And what you'll notice when two planes intersect each other is that there is not just a single solution, that there is instead a whole uh, range of solutions. There's all of these coordinates along this line here. They are all um, intersections, aren't they? So the way that two planes actually intersect is two planes intersect forming a line, intersect along a straight line. And there's two different ways that you can go about these questions, OK? One of them uses this property. The normal to the normal, the normals, sorry, the normal to the normals of both planes is the direction of the line. And I'm going to try and draw that, but it's quite difficult to do. Okay. So if you think about this plane that you've got here, there's a normal coming off it like this. There's a normal coming up like this. This blue line that I've got here is perpendicular to both of those normals. So this direction here is normal to this one and to this one. And if you think about that like with your books in front of you, if you just think about like a plane like this, the normal to both of those pages is the, the spine of the book. And that kind of makes sense. If you look at one of them individually, you're like, oh, yeah, they're going perpendicular. If you look at that one, oh, yeah, they're going perpendicular. Both together, the intersection of them is the spine of the book. So the planes intersecting sort of reminds me of a book. Except two normals create another Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those two normals are creating another plane, and then they are the normal to that plane. Yeah, I've, I've not thought of that before. Yeah, almost like. The, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. It's kind of hard. I try and draw these things on, and I go, like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. Um, so that's one of the things you can do. If the question leads you down this route to find the normal to the normals, which is what the question, actually, that Edexcel used, then this is a shortcut. All you then need to do is find a common point 
on both planes. Let's just call that, I don't know, A. And so then the line of intersection would just be R equals A plus lambda N. You don't need to memorize this. This is just me explaining. If you know a common point here, and if you know the direction of the line, then you know the equation of the line, right? You just know a point that's on both planes, and you know the, that the direction is the normal. The other technique to do this is to just find two common points. You understand what I mean by common points on both planes at the same time. Find two common points on both planes. What do you think you can do after you found two common points on both planes? Yeah, you can subtract them to find the, the direction. Find two common points on both planes. Find the vector through them. And that's the direction. And then you just um, form the line equation. So in further pure one, there's a new technique that you can learn that helps you to find a perpendicular vector given two other vectors. So this vector here and this vector here, which are the normals of the plane, you do a particular calculation which is called the vector cross product. You cross those two vectors and it produces a third vector which is perpendicular to both of them. It just does it in one step rather than us having to kind of really labour the point of which is perpendicular to both of them. You just learn this new technique, uh, which actually links back to matrices again. It's all, this is all part of the matrices topic, um, and it just allows you to find something that is perpendicular. But we don't actually need it for, for this at all. Okay. So I'm going to try it with the exam question they gave us as an example, um, and then you, you can try one um, that's there, and then that will probably finish us up for the lesson. Okay. So has everyone got this bit written down? Yeah, Ishak. Um, N is the normal to the normals of both planes. So it's, it's this normal, which is normal to both of those other normals. So if I call this one N3, this one is N1, and this one is N2, then it's N3 over here and N3 over here. OK? So the exam question that was here, um, I've crossed out the first part because we we're not quite ready to do this one, which is about the shortest distance. Um, but it tells us an equation of one of the planes up here, and it tells us an equation of another plane over here. But what you'll notice um, is that this plane is in parametric form. Okay, So it says, um, plane one has this equation. I'm actually just going to write it because I don't like it in that form. Plane one has the equation this. Plane two has this other equation which is r equals, whoops, not lambda equals, but lambda 131 one plus mu 2 minus 1, 1. Show that the vector 4, 1, minus 7 is perpendicular to plane 2. What does that mean that I'm going to need to do? If I was to just, this is a sketch of plane 2. I know a vector that's on it, and I know another vector that's on it. And I'm wanting to show that this vector which is 4, 1, minus 7, is perpendicular to them. What do I have to do, do you think? Um, I could find the normal, but even quicker than that, rather than finding the normal and then showing it's, perpendic it's, it's the same as this. I could just do the scalar dot product. I could just do this one dotted with this, and this one dotted with this. And this red one should be perpendicular to this one, and it should be perpendicular to this one. So should we, ex we should expect them to be equal to 0, OK? So let's have a look. Um, so for this part B, we've got 4, 1, minus 7. And I'm going to dot it with 1, 3, 1. So that's 4 plus 3 minus 7, which is equal to 0. And then I'll do the other one, which is 4, 1, minus 7, dotted with 2, uh, minus 1, 1 which is 8 minus 1 minus 7, which is equal to 0. Unfortunately, that's not enough. You have to then write a sentence 
to say, hence, the vector 4, 1, minus 7 is perpendicular to, the, to that plane. Uh, yeah, you could say it's normal, but it's only because in here the language was that they asked us to show that it was perpendicular. So I'm just mirroring that language back to the examiner so that they know I'm directly on, ask, um, answering what they wanted. So then part C says find the acute angle between plane one and plane two. Um, I don't know if I'm going to do this. I might just write down what the formula is or ask you what the formula is. Arifal, do you remember what the formula is for this? Yep. And it wants the acute angle. So just do the modulus just in case it gives you a negative, just to make sure it's positive. Um, so I'm not going to do part C, because you can do that. But N1 and N2 that you would be using, what would be the N1 and what would be the N2? N1 would be 4, 1, minus 2. So it's just um, where did you get 4, 1, minus 2 from? Oh, 4, 1, minus 7. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is going to be one of them here. And what's N2 going to be? 2 minus 3, 4, this one that's up here, OK? OK, now, obviously, this part is now to do um, part D of the question. Now, part D of the question, there are those two different techniques. You could either try and find something that is normal to both N1 and N2, or and I actually, I've, I think I've misremembered this question. I thought the question led you through that to make you do that, but they haven't actually asked us to do this. So I apologize. I've, I have to go back on what I said there. The question hasn't led us down this strategy here. I thought from my memory that it, it encouraged us to use strategy one, but actually, I don't think it really matters. Personally, if I were to recommend which of these to, to use, I would put a star on the second one. I think the second one is the easiest kind of one to do that we've got here, okay? So we've got these two planes, and we need to find out what these two planes, uh, what these two planes are. Okay. So the first one we've already got here. That's fine. Okay. We now need to think about what is the equation of the second plane in scalar dot form. So I want the scalar dot form of plane two. Well, we know it's going to be r dotted with. 4, 1, minus 7. Do, do we know what it's going to be equal to, though? Do we know any coordinates that are definitely on plane 2? You should be able zero. to. 0. How do I know 0? There's no, like, point yeah, there's no point given in, in that parametric form. There's usually r equals a plus lambda b plus mu c. But there is no a. So it must go through the origin, which must mean that it's equal to 0. OK? So I'm going to have a look at the Cartesian forms of both of these. I think that's probably the easiest way for us to think about this one. Um, so the Cartesian forms are 2x minus 3y plus 4z equals 8. And then for this one, we've got 4x plus y minus 7z is equal to 0. Now, here comes the point where we get flashbacks again to matrices. I need to find, well, what do I need to find? What did the strategy say is a good thing to try and find here if we're trying to find out how these intersect? And to find two points that are on both of these lines. Any suggestions of how we find two points that are on both of these lines? We don't need to use a matrix. So you're right, we could use a matrix to solve this. Simultaneous equations. Or, so there's two ways, OK? You can either use these calculators. Do you think there will be a unique answer to these two simultaneous equations? Why not, Sam? You nodded your head straight away. If it's a line, we know it's a line. So we know there's going to be lots and lots and lots of solutions. So imagine you didn't have this calculator. What could you do instead? If we. Good. You could assume that z was 1 or that z was 0. Normally, when we've assumed z is 0, we say it could sometimes go wrong. So it's maybe best to say z is equal to 1. On your calculators, though, um, I'm actually just going to, I remember, I've now got this camera here, so I'm going to just quickly put this on. 
So you know you can go to uh, menu, equation, polynomial, oh, not polynomial, simultaneous, three unknowns. So what's the first one? It was 2 minus 3, 4, and it was equal to 8, right? And then the next one was 4, 1, minus 7, 0. And so we get these many, many solutions that there are like this, OK? So we've got here that z is equal to z. Um, and then we've got these ones that x are equal to and that y are equal to. So because we're going to need two different solutions here, we can put in two different values for z that might be helpful for us. Uh, what do you think looks like an easy value for z? One, one and an easy, even easier than that? Zero. Zero. OK, so let's actually do that. Let's say um, let z equals zero, then we can actually, just because we've done the simultaneous equations on our calculator, if z is equal to zero, x is equal to four sevenths, and y is equal to 16 sevenths. x is equal to, I can't even remember what I just said, four sevenths, and y is equal to minus 16 sevenths. If z is equal to one, we get four sevenths plus x is equal to 4 sevenths plus 17 over 14, uh, which is going to be 25 over 14. And y is equal to minus 16 over 7 plus 15 over 7, which is minus 1 over 7. So we've got these two coordinates, 4 over 7, minus 16 over 7, 0. I don't think so. I, don't, I really don't think so. Because as soon as you've said z equals 0 and let z equal 0, let z equal 1, you can just whack it on a calculator. And we got some guidance from Edexcel that said, if a student can do it on a calculator and it's not a show that question or an algebra question, we should anticipate that students will be doing these things on their calculators. Okay? So using that, that, that um, simultaneous equation solver is, is really smart to use here. So we get x is 25 over 14 y is minus 1 over 7, and z is equal to 1. Now, am I allowed to just be like, oh, I don't like these fractions. I'm just going to multiply everything. No, I can't do that for this one that I've got here. So what I'm going to have to do is just proceed with the rest of the question. I'm now going to subtract them from each other to find a direction. So the direction is going to be this one, take away this one. So 25 over 14, take away 4 over 7. Uh, what's that? 25 over 14, take away 4 over 7. That's 17 over 14. And then I'm doing this one, take away this one. So that's minus 1 over 7, minus minus 16 over 7, which is 15 over 7. And then I've got 1 minus 0, which is 1. So I've just done this one, take away this one. I did that, take away that. And so my equation of the line is r equals one of these coordinates. I don't mind which one. 4 sevenths minus 16 sevenths 0 plus, I think they've probably already used lambda in the question, haven't they? Lambda and mu. So I'm going to say plus t, lots of 17 over 4, 15 over 7, 1. Uh, thank you. 17 over 14. Thank you. So the calculator takes all of the like the maths out of it. And what you'll probably find with vectors is there's not much maths in the questions. There's the well, there's not much computational maths. There's a lot of thinking maths instead. Okay? Um, I'm going to find this question just to show you the mark scheme in a second. I know we want to pack up and go. What you're going to do for homework is the exercise 9E, not all of the questions. I'll tell you which ones on Padlet. And I also want you to try this question here, okay? So you need to find out the equation of the line between these two things that we've got here. So you also need to do this for homework.